Welcome to a Monday edition of Beyond the Arc. I'm your host, John Gonzalez, alongside our NBA insider, Bill Ryder. And fresh off some sort of car race in Miami, actually, Nicole <laughs> Moss. What was that? Um, so F1, the Grand Prix, um, you know, goes around the U.S. It hits Austin. Mm -hmm. It was in Vegas. And it does Miami every year as well. So um, I'm not really well-versed in F1. I like cars. Um, I only know Lewis Hamilton, but he never wins. So don't really know why I'm supporting. But congrats. <laughs> um, the food's really expensive. It's really hot, but it's cool. Like the stuff, I would say the stuff it, around the weekend is cooler than the actual race. Like there's like stuff going on in Miami and like on the beach and stuff, but the race is $180 for nachos. Yes. It's a real price tag. Wow. It's wow. Not a thing. It's not a thing. Uh, they yeah. race in the streets, right? I, I know nothing so, about so racing. That's only like in the one in Vegas, they race through the strip, which I heard was pretty cool. The one in Austin, they also race through the streets. The one down here, it's interesting because it was actually originally supposed to be like where the heat play. They were supposed to race through all the streets in downtown Miami, but all the people who live in the buildings vetoed it. So they moved it to Miami Gardens where Hard Rock Stadium is and around the parking lot, they built a track. So <laughs> not as sexy as Monaco, but you know. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, <laughs> I'm I'm glad you had a good time with that. That's not really my bag, but it, I guess like the event around it sounds. Yeah, the event's like cool. The event's on. cool. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, all right. Well, later in the show, we're going to talk about basketball now. Later in the show, mm -hmm. uh, the Cavs took game seven and move on. We're going to discuss the Clippers headed for a tough offseason. And we're going to preview. I'm sure you're very excited about this, Ashley. The Pacers and the Knicks series that gets underway tonight. But first, Nuggets and Wolves. Very interesting. Wolves take game one in Denver, 106-99, to take a one nothing lead in that series. They're 5-0 and this postseason. It's the longest win streak in the postseason in franchise history. The previous 19 years, they were 4-0 and 12 in the playoffs and gang first time the nugs have trailed in a series in two years uh ant-man he's here he's real sure is i mean this series was this series was interesting i mean this game obviously not series but this series was interesting going into it um i felt like the timberwolves are going to give the nuggets a hard time for a multitude of reasons their size anthony edwards has just been absolutely phenomenal but this was the first time the Nuggets were held to under under 100 points in the postseason. So that speaks volumes, right? Um, they struggled offensively. I think the biggest thing that I took away from it is, obviously, I think they have more size on the inside with Kat and Rudy Gobert. But the biggest question mark for me of what I saw in game one, Jamal Murray, man, he does not look healthy. Like, he looks like he's there but he does not nearly look like he's 100% there physically. And I think if you don't have Jamal Murray, a healthy Jamal Murray, it's going to put a strain on this offense to go ahead and fill the void that he, you know, fills when he is 100% healthy. Because I don't know if the plan is to cover and mask what he's unable to do because he's not 100% and really like tap in and zone in on what he can but they got to figure something out because you don't have an answer for Anthony Edwards as it is. You need all the offensive scoring you can help. And he just does not look on his P's and Q's. Like, I don't know what's going on with him at all. Yeah. And you're right about Jamal Murray. They, they need it because and I, I'm not going to overreact. Right. I'm not, although I was thinking about the CBS predictive model that John, you brought up either on the pod or maybe on one no. of our CBS sports. Ain't no in the first minutes. round. Yeah, it, no, it's it's crushing it, and they like the Timberwolves, if I remember yep. right, in this series. Yep. They, they liked Minnesota. So here's another issue that, that we saw, and why, Ash, you're right, they better have Jamal Murray. I mean, you better have Jamal Murray in mm -hmm. a vacuum, but this is not a vacuum because I know Jokic is amazing. He's the best player on earth. I don't want to get carried away. And he had a pretty good line. What was it? Was it I don't have a 32-9-8 or 32-8-9. Mm -hmm. But he, I uh, have never seen – 9 and 8 yeah. Yeah, I've never seen – Nicola have to work that hard in a game that mattered. And look, a little inefficient, that's fine. He just, and, and you brought this up, Ash, the size of Gobert, the size mm -hmm. of Nas Reed. I mean, if Cat's there, he's not a small Rats dude. I mean, they, game. Nas Reed, six man of the year, like he handled business. Devet, yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to be, can Jokic still be Jokic? Of course he can, but it's going to be, I think, so much harder if the first game is anything to go on. And Tim Connolly is the guy, and I think you brought this up on HQ as well, and everyone's talking about it around the league. Tim Connolly is the guy that built the Nuggets, was in charge of basketball ops there before they won their championship, moved to Minnesota. And it was kind of a weird move when he did it. And then he's the guy that traded four first-round picks to go get Gobert, and we all thought the guy forgot how to be a GM. 
but he's built a team that if anybody can frazzle Jokic and anybody can make life hard enough on Denver that maybe you can beat them, it looks like this Timberwolves team. And I'll just close with this because I've already lost the bet and I've already, it's over. But I will say this in my defense. I did not know Anthony Edwards was actually Michael Jordan, like incarnate, at least in, in the playoffs, because what Ant is doing in conjunction with a team built to make life really hard for, for Jokic, I have I have completely recalibrated everything I think about the Timberwolves, and I'm prepared. they got to be Denver, but they are as much a contender as anybody out there, and I think that's the – whatever happens going you forward, that's the takeaway from that you game. You didn't see the side-by-side that circulates after every good game that yeah. Anthony Edwards has where it's like half Jordan, half Anthony Edwards. Are we going to talk about why? No. They do somewhat look alike. I'm not saying that's his kid or anything crazy like that. Okay, there it is. They do like have like, very similar like facial <laughs> structures. It's weird. Like it's kind I of wasn't weird. gonna go there, but you he know, does from a basketball perspective, just like twelve what he did in the fourth quarter, his spinning turnaround shot that he I, I mean, just the guy is I mean, that's all cliches, but the guy is just cold blooded and amazing in the clutch. He's just he out he carried the the T Wolves offensively. Against the Denver Nuggets, and he's unfazed at every step so far. He looked amazing. I mean, he went for 43, 7, and 3, and he cooked pretty much everybody they put on him. With KCP as the principal defender, he was 8 for 11. With Aaron Gordon, when the, I thought they would throw some Aaron Gordon at him because, you know, size-wise, that could be a potentially interesting matchup for, for Denver, who's 3 for 3 against Aaron Gordon. Jamal Murray had some ser- – to Ashley's point about Jamal Murray not looking right – he was three for three against Jamal Murray when Jamal Murray was the principal defender. And even worse for the Nuggets, the the Wolves clearly had a game plan of hunting Jamal Murray in the pick and roll. And when they did hunt Jamal Murray in the pick and roll, not to get too into the weeds on the stats here, but they were averaging north of two points per possession in the pick and roll when they targeted Jamal Murray. And like, if you're at one, you're doing pretty well. If you're north of one, you're doing really well. If you're at two points per possession, that is like ridiculous efficiency and a really bad sign for the nuggets because you know that the wolves are going to keep trying that until the nuggets come up with a way to stop that. But to the idea of, I also think it's just like to simplify it. It's just very impressive for a team this young and this inexperienced in the playoffs to go into Denver home of the reigning champs and game one, set mm-hmm. the tone for the rest of the series. Like the cliche that yeah. we always hear in the playoffs, yeah. the series doesn't start until someone loses at home. It is a statement game to let that that game changer be game one. Like they rolled in there, laser focused and said, we're going to take your heart and we're going to take it early in this series. And that's exactly what they did. And to have that killer instinct for a team that once again is young and also inexperienced when it comes to this time of year, because they are, is just, that's what I feel like for me is the scariest part of it. Cause teams have bad games and like, that's not a surprise I'm with you. at all. Like, you know, sometimes yeah. it's just a little bit, they went in there with that killer instinct right from the get go. And it's just like, damn, it's, I don't know. Like that. And Jokic, Jokic, Jokic like, like oh, shook. Crap. Yeah. I- Yo, and I, I thought maybe I was seeing something that wasn't there. And then the post game press conference, he they ask him what what he needs to sort of deal with uh, the, all the height and the length, and he says a clone of myself, which is kind of everybody laughed, but that is not a good sign if you're the Denver Nuggets. That that's where he's at already. Well, like we said, I mean, like the the Wolves are a really difficult matchup issue and an interesting one academically, but we saw it in game one, how it manifested itself when they have those three bigs and they really harassed him. And we talked about it on HQ, like, yeah, Joker went for 32, nine and eight, but they made him work in all of it. And I think, you know, the, when I was talking about Jamal Murray targeting him, it was also in the pick and roll with Joker. So he had to do uh, work at both ends of the floor and it was a lot to ask of him. And then meanwhile, you've got Anthony Edwards being absolutely outrageous in that first game. And I was wondering, like, I was thinking about it, you know, he's 22 years old and he plays out of his head at both ends of the floor Mm -hmm. and has obviously influenced this series and the postseason significantly. And is he already in, he is in the conversation, but I'm trying to figure out who else should be in it, of the best two-way players in the NBA. And like the people I came up with were off the top of my head, and Bede and Giannis and like I guess to a lesser extent just because is like he you know he's we saw him, him not be available Kawhi for the postseason like maybe we're already talking about Wemby but that's the conversation he's in right now who am I yeah. missing? 
I mean, is Paul George still somebody you would you would point I mean, to? Like, not really. Well, we're down tier. the list, right? Yeah, second tier. And did you already throw this stat out there? Like, Ed- I mean, he's he's been really committing to defense as of late. Can you put Luca? Whether it's like a low, no, low? no? absolutely not. He's been better in the. He's operated well in that he defense the way defense. Steph does. But he's, he's not trying harder. But he's not a. Def- he's not a good Edwards. Defender. What are the stats? Edwards and the guys that he that he was the primary defender on in that game shot, I think, 28% of that game for the Nuggets. Like, like Edwards was also yeah. arguably the best defender in the game yesterday. I, I mean, it's – I'm with you, John. It's, and, Ash, you said this, I think, a month or two ago, and I was like, oh, okay, maybe. But now you're right. You're ahead of it. He's going to be the face of the league because he's yeah. got that – he's got something. He's got – like, he's just got it. And then you throw in the fact that dude can win in the playoffs and, and he's person, fearless. And he, he is also like a personality. I think he's also, yeah, he's cool. He's fun. And I think that not he's that super she, fun, not that he's that, cocky that, as shit. Right. Good way. Not that like it should matter, but it does matter because when we talk about the face of the league, you kind of want somebody personable. And I know maybe that's a little bit direct contrast to like a Jordan. Jordan wasn't the most like personable person in the world. He wasn't like the friendliest, but people really just wanted to be like him. And I think that Anthony Edwards has that appeal, but he also has like yeah. personality. And I don't know if it's because he just grew up in a different generation. He's younger, but he's funny. Like he's engaging, like he gives sound bites. And I think that, you know, he just has everything in the equation of like what the face of the league should be like on paper, you know. I'm and very, he's edgy. He yeah. got that tech. He got that tech from. By the way, thank God that that, that was not decided by a point, right? At Denver, because he got that garbage tech from just who was he staring down, John? I can't remember. He was just like just in somebody's uh, grill. I, it might they have been Jamal. I don't. I don't remember. I uh, do remember Jamal Murray a, giving finger guns afterwards, and like he didn't get a tech. And I'm like, what are we doing? We're getting. We're giving techs for people right. staring other guys down, making great plays. In the it was postseason. awesome. I mean, like, I love on, the guy. That's ridiculous. I am very, very interested before we move on here to see how the Nuggets respond tonight. I would expect that they bounce back and take one on the floor and they, they go uh, to Minnesota with the series. They better. But as Ashley mentioned, like that is a statement win by the Wolves out of the gate where everybody was like, hey, this could be kind of interesting on paper. Like they Tim Connolly is kind of playing chess against himself here. He set up the first team and now he's setting up the team that could end up beating that team. Uh, I will say that the Nuggets opened as the favorite. Bill and I were talking about this on Friday. Uh, they opened up as the favorite. Now the favorite in the series is the Wolves. So amazing. I mean, amazing. very, very interesting. We'll see if uh, Ant and those guys can get it done or if Joker and Jamal bounce back tonight. We're going to take a quick break. And then on the other side, we're going to discuss perhaps the least anticipated game seven in NBA history. That's coming up <laughs> on Beyond the Arc. One final stop on the road to London. The UEFA Champions League semifinals on CBS and stream every match live on Paramount+. Plus. Welcome back to Beyond the Arc on a Monday. John, Ashley, and Bill here. You can find us wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Please download, subscribe, leave a review. All right. Cavs and Magic. The 4-5 went to a Game 7. Normally you hear Game 7 and everybody's like, I can't wait for this. It's going to be amazing. I'm not even sure people in Cleveland and Orlando were excited about it, but the game was played and the Cavs won. They're marching on after winning Game 7. Home team won all uh, seven of those games in the series, by the way, and it's the first series win for the Cavs without LeBron since 1993. Hey, wow. that was the year I was born. Shout out to 93. All right. How about okay. that? Uh, Donovan Mitchell went for 39, <laughs> 9, and 5. He's the he's only the second Cav ever to have 30 points in a Game 7. I'll give you one guess on who the other one is. Uh, Jared Smith. Just, anything for you guys? <laughs> nice, yeah. I, I had to watch it for work. Like, so I had to, like, not just watch it, pay attention. Yeah, I mean, I don't, Ash, I don't know. Was, so the Magic got up 18, and then for, they they couldn't miss, and then they reverted back to being pretty pedestrian or worse offensively, and then Donovan Mitchell took over. So, no, it didn't do a lot for me. I wish I had been watching it with a beer in my hand. I was watching with a notebook in my hand, Ash. So it was not – I was not into it. Maybe it was just being forced to watch the drudgery of this game, even though the end was kind of fun. I mean, two things that I took away from that game. I only watched, like, the second half of it. Um the first thing I took away was I think the future is so bright in Orlando, like super, super excited for what the Orlando magic are going to be. They also are just so big at every single position. It's just, that's a really big team with so much potential. So Orlando like is going to be in the conversation, you know, when we talk playoffs for, for many, many years to come, unless something like just catastrophic happens. Um, On the other side, 
looking at the Cavs, I mean, listen, Donovan Mitchell, like, put the team on his back. You know, Darius Garland was really, like, very inconsistent throughout that entire Not season. Great. Not great at all. So Donovan Mitchell really just was, like, tired of the narrative of him being inconsistent in, you know, when it came to the playoffs and really was just hell-bent on changing that narrative. So um, good for him. Love that for him. Going into the Celtics series, like, here's my thing. Like, I – the only reason I give this series not being a sweep is because I think the Celtics have a bad habit of making things more difficult for themselves than it has to be, not because I think the Cavs stand a chance. I can see the series going six just because the Celtics like to make things difficult for themselves. But I don't know. There's something about this Cavs team. It doesn't seem like the supporting cast is able to – function on the same timeline, the same wavelength as Donovan Mitchell. Like I looked up a crazy stat, which was Donovan Mitchell was averaging 28 points per game, but the Cavs scored just a point per a point per possession over their seven games with the Orlando Magic. And the only team that was less efficient than that were the Pelicans. It's just not a I don't know. It's just they're not, just not good on offense. They're not yes, good on it's offense. Not a good offensive Paolo, team at all. Paolo Bacaro was really good. Uh, he went yeah. for 38 and 16 in game seven. He also had three steals and a block. And for the series, he averaged 28, 8, and 4. He was awesome. But like Franz he's Wagner great. has like Wagner boys. Yeah. He's been like kind of I expected him to take the step forward this year. And he kind of was inconsistent. And like there's a conversation to be made. I know everybody just decides to like throw the max at these young guys because they're their own homegrown players, but I don't know. I think like between him and Evan Mobley, I don't think are just like auto max guys on their next deals. I think there's like conversations to be made there. Um, yeah. How do you, if you're Orlando, I don't think you have I know. I know because I, like, he's their guy and you'd think, okay, we got to lock him up for the, like the full max, but like, can't you get a little bit of a discount there? Cause it's like just maybe on the numbers. Somebody, I'm with you. Glass half full Wagner and Suggs, I think combined uh, yeah. like three shots. They were, they were awful. Glass half full. Maybe there's a world where this is the experience, right? You have to go through some pain and they make the leap next year, especially Wagner. Because to your point, Ash, I, I like Orlando's future too. They just have to ha find some more offense. You're not they have to find name, more offense. You're not saying his name with a nut emphasis. You guys say like Clark says it, the Wagner boys. <laughs> Wagner. I, like the, I like the German uh, inflection. Wagner. It's always, Wagner it's always good fun. Wagner. <laughs> For offense, um, Aaron and I were talking about this before we move on to the to the Clippers, and we're going to preview the Boston Cavs series to the extent that it needs previewing tomorrow when we're on CBS Sports Network. But uh, Aaron and I were talking about this free agent uh, D'Angelo Russell interest anybody in Orlando? That kind of makes sense for them. Just a, a team that plays great defense that doesn't need him to play defense, and can, he can just jack up three. Yeah. Like, okay, play uh, no. <laughs> Somebody's answer. Find him. <laughs> I mean, Paul George would excite me a lot more. I know that Philly, you want him in Philly, but he's been linked to Orlando too. It also make a lot of sense. I would, take, is, Paul, I would take Paul George in a Knicks jersey. That is an excellent transition by both of you, bringing up Paul George. Uh, we, we've spent all the time we're going to spend on the Cavs, but we are going to talk about the Clippers uh, and this offseason. They get bounced. They lose the series 4-2. I know that Paul George said that they had gone to uh, Dallas down 3-2 before and made it sound like they could come back to L.A. and keep the series alive. They cannot. Uh, they lose that series. They went on that amazing like 25 and six tear in the middle of the season. And since then uh, the wheels have come off a little bit North of $200 million gang for yet another first round exit. This is five seasons with Kawhi and PG and they've won four playoff series total over that uh, span and two first round exits in a row. Very disappointing for the Clippers who now have lots of decisions to make in the off season. I want my apologies from everybody who said I was a Clippers hater. Like that's mm -hmm. even a thing. It's not. Yeah. And a James no Clippers Harden fan, so. I am only accepting apologies in cash. I told Harden. everybody that the Clippers were not winning a chip this year. They're like, yeah, they are. They got James Harden, Paul George, and Kawhi. Watch, watch, watch. Okay, well, they're in Cancun. And I told you that James Harden was going to show himself it was only a matter of time. And what I don't happened? think it was really on Harden, oh, though. No. He showed mm -hmm. what he did. He showed he, he wasn't was. bad. He wasn't great. He wasn't bad. He wasn't great at times. He wasn't enough. The last two games. No, he wasn't enough. At the end. At the, end. At the, end. At the, the last two games. Good. 
of this series, he scored under 20 points. He was a non-factor in both of those well, games. One was well, an the team. game, and one was a chance to go ahead and swing the series in your direction, and he failed both. And Paul George, he's not escaping fault, too. I'm coming for him as well. They both did not hold their weight when it came to the last two games of this series, and that is why they are home. They should be ashamed of themselves. I, the whole team wasn't great. I, I'm just saying over the course of the series, if you look at his numbers, they're really not that bad. The but yes, two. in the last two, sure, absolutely. But I mean, you know, come they on, also didn't, he wasn't that he wasn't good at the end of the series when they needed him to play he, well. Like he, he never he is. He's always his stats right are always schedule. fine. Right on schedule. Out of context. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yes. I, I also think the Clippers had bigger issues than that. Like you unplug Kawhi and all of a sudden, like the warts really start to show. And PG also wasn't great. In, in the postseason, his numbers dipped, his shooting dipped. Like he had, uh, he shot a career best percentage from, from three during the regular season. And then he dipped a little bit in that series. And like quite clearly that Clippers experiment that they've been trying to do since they put Kawhi next to PG, it hasn't yielded results. And now they're going into this new building in the off season. You got PG, who's an unrestricted free agent. You've got, uh, who hasn't signed his extension. And then you've got Harden, who's an unrestricted free agent. And like, what are they going to do? I expect that they're going to throw some money at both of them, but are they going to throw enough money at PG to keep them around? And Harden, I, I mean, I guess you just bring him back at 35 because you got, you need somebody to buy into that building. For what? Well, first of all, shout out to them. They're going to have enough bathrooms. So like, that's a plus in this whole conversation, right? 1500. Plenty of bathrooms. Congrats. Here's the thing with James Harden. When he got to the Clippers, my biggest thing was this. There is a 99.9% .9 chance Kawhi is going to fall at some point of the season. And it is going to be a very, very bad point of the season where it's like, damn, now James Harden is option number two. And that's exactly what happened. And again, James Harden did what James Harden always does. When the chips fall and I need you to step up to the plate and go ahead and help us take this thing to the next level. And I'm not saying it's a hundred percent him to your point, Paul George did not play great, but this is who James Harden is. When you need him the most, he disappears. Kawhi went down your option. Number two, it was bound to happen. And you did what you always do. You did nothing. You did absolutely nothing to bring him back with this big three. Again, if you keep Paul George and you keep Kawhi and you bring him back, the Clippers are insane. All you are going to do is. I mean, you're right, but they don't have a choice, Ash. They, I mean, you're yeah. you're not wrong. There's no choice. They don't have, they don't have the flexibility to do. They're you can kind of either, into it. yeah, have the illusion that you can be good with the same group, or you can just well, have a team that's not as good. Agency, though, can he? He can leave, but they can't replace him. If if, I mean, if they can't yeah. sign him, they don't have the flexibility to replace him. And I, right. I think the I think the real question for the Clippers isn't what they do. That's not the question. I think it's uh, it's what does Paul George want, and yes. what does he want to do. That's the and to a lesser degree Harden. And if Harden leaves, the the Suns are the betting favorite, which I I presume means oh my god, <laughs> just don't take a bunch. I know, don't take a bunch well, of money. How how are they? How are the Suns possibly going to sign? They can't because they can it doesn't only make, bring in minimum salary guys. It doesn't make any sense. But they're the betting favorite, so you there must be somebody. Yeah, you'd have to move like Durant you know, or yeah, somebody. Yeah, um, not, well, not going to move Booker. You, move? you have to move Booker. You can't move Beal. Nah, you move Durant. I don't think you move Booker. But James Harden is not going to want to play in Phoenix without Kevin Durant. I'm just telling that those like those are he is the betting if he leaves the Clippers I think he's four to one or three to one to be a son, which means they're fat. But the Paul George thing is interesting. Like if you're Paul George, why do you really? You go to Philly, you're a contender. You go to Orlando, you're the guy, but you're maybe the guy on a team that has an interesting ceiling. Because to your point, Ash, the Clippers aren't good enough. I think it's it's a Paul George question. It's not a Clippers. But the I mean, Clippers will this take. This is my point because the Clippers have to decide what they're going to do about like if they're going to offer him the max. Because if they if they don't offer him the max, then all of a sudden it becomes an easier decision for Paul George, who can go. All right, well, we've tried this and tried this, and it hasn't worked here. And also, I'm getting way more money to go to Philadelphia and be the third guy as opposed to less money to stay in LA where it hasn't worked and be the second guy. If I'm the Clippers, though, would he be the third guy really, in Philly though? Yeah, absolutely. He'd be the third guy. Above Tyrese Maxey, if he got there. No, no. Tyrese Maxey has very much established himself as the one A to. to I'm just saying because Paul George does have like a star power that Maxey doesn't have. So I don't know if that would just. Yeah, but I mean, you slot him into that Tobias Harris role as the third guy who actually plays defense, and that's a massive upgrade for the Sixers. But from the for the Clippers, 
I think Bill is right that they're kind of like backed into it. It's rocking a hard place. You, you basically have to hope that Harden and PG come back because the alternative is to go into that new building with no hope whatsoever. But if you if they were being honest with themselves and the building wasn't, if the Intuit Dome wasn't a component here, they should have just hit the detonation button on this thing. So it's there's a few rebuild. things that- It is I, rebuild I think time. It, for sure. There's a few things to keep in mind here. Let me just like give you a little, so everything I've heard is they're going to, they're gonna they're gonna do they're gonna offer these guys the money. And Steve Ballmer, I mean, like Ishbia, like Matt Ishbia, like other guys, he's actually the ones making the decisions. I know Lawrence Frank is the Lawrence is more he's the president of operations. But as I've been told, Ballmer made the decision to to go all in on these guys several years ago. He's still committed. He doesn't care about the money. He thinks it can work. He's probably a more likable version of, of the owner of the Suns, Matt Ishbia, in that he doesn't know what he's doing, but he thinks that he does and he's pulling the strings. So John Ash, I, I, th everything I've heard is the expectation is Paul George will be offered all the money. They'll pay, they'll pay James what he's got to be paid, and and they'll roll back this broken team again. But I don't, again, I don't think they have a choice. It won't work. But I'm not sure what the alternative is. Godspeed to the Clippers. I will say that uh, there were some rumors about the coach Ty Lu, and maybe he wanted to just stick at crypto when they move over to Intuit, and uh, didn't sound like that in his post game press conference. He said that he didn't want to bop around, and it looks like the Clippers are targeting an extension with him. So at least they'll have a good coach. Uh, all right, we're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to preview the start of the second round series that Ashley is very excited about. It's the Knicks and the Pacers. We'll do that next on Beyond the Arc. And there, started to get in the groove. So impressive. Lock your schedules. Aces are coming to CBS Sports Network. Welcome back to Beyond the Arc. Check us out on our YouTube page. You can find us at Beyond the Arc CBS. Subscribe, hit the like button, leave a comment. Uh, tonight, the second round series between the Knicks and the Pacers kicks off. It's the first time that, they, that the Knicks have been uh, winners of first round series and back-to-back -back season since 99-2000. They're the favorites in this series, Ashley, despite the fact that the Pacers beat them two out of three games during the regular season. How are you feeling about this? Um, I feel good. I have Nixon six. That was my lucky prediction last year. I'm sticking with that for this one. I do think this is going to be interesting, right? Because I do think that these two teams do 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 two different things really well. I think it's going to be a battle of Nick's offense versus, I'm sorry, Pacers offense versus Nick's defense. The Pacers, I think, were like top three in pace in the NBA. So this okay, is a yeah. fast team. They like to play quick. They like to dictate the pace. Also, this is a high scoring team. I think they were only held to under 100 points once in the regular season. So this is a team that scores a lot of points and they move quick. I don't think like unlike the 76ers series where I feel like a few of those games for the Knicks were one on the boards and the rebounds. I think the biggest thing here is the Knicks not allowing the Pacers to dictate the pace and also not turning the ball over. Because if you have a team that already scores at such a high volume you need as many opportunities as you get as you can get to have more opportunities to make shots right so you have to go ahead and force turnovers on their end and make sure you don't turn the ball over to not go ahead and strip yourself of possessions i think those two things are the biggest keys but i think because they're such a defensive team the knicks are i think that's going to go ahead and help them in the series against indiana which is why i think it goes six I find this hard to gauge because I, I do think the Knicks are contenders. I think that's clear. I It's hard for me to know what the Pacers are because they played a team that was basically broken in the first round. And so to be able to make, a real for me, a real assessment of how good Indiana is actually starts tonight. I mean, you're right. They pace a play, and that doesn't usually translate to the playoffs. Maybe it will. Now, they move the ball exceptionally well yeah, as well. So, good. I mean, it, it, like the Knicks are going to be tested. That defense is going to be tested. It, I think we all agree the Knicks have something. There, Jalen Brunson is it. He's the real deal. And that beating the Sixers in that series, both those teams to me look like conference finals or better basketball teams. John, I don't, I don't know how to gauge the Pacers yet because I don't think that series against the Bucks should have gone that long. When you think about there was no Giannis and Lillard injury and the fact that right for stretches of that series, Middleton was the best player on the floor for Milwaukee. I maybe the Pacers are the real deal. Maybe they're not. For, this is when the challenge actually I think begins. Betting fit Knicks are the heavy betting favorite minus 245 Pacers plus 200 CBS predictive model that just aced the first round likes them heavily Knicks 58 uh, to, to Pacers 42. The pace 
thing, though, is interesting to me because Ashley pointed out, you know, the Pacers like to push the ball, right? Second in pace, second in offensive rating. Knicks like to muck it up. We just saw what happened. They like yep. to play in the half court offense. Pacers half court uh, defense hasn't been uh, particularly good. And and you're right, Bill, that you know the translating how you play in the regular season to the postseason isn't always analogous. But we did see the Pacers really push the ball a lot against. Uh, Milwaukee, yeah, it's a fractured Milwaukee team, but like not especially on misses, they're they're out and running. And even on makes, there were so many times in that final yeah. game where like they're getting the ball off a of make and and trying to push the ball. And I'm like, wow, that like in, they inbounded so fast. So like coming off a, a Knicks Sixer series where every possession was critical, every possession was hard fought and mm -hmm. defense and like like intense as opposed to like the Pacers playing a much more wide open style and moving the ball around. Like I have no idea how these two teams are going to match up and like, who's going to dictate the style of play. I do think I, I have the Knicks in seven. Uh, I like them. As, seven. I think it, yeah. I think it's going to be a closer series than people expect. I will. I I'll will go Knicks in five, five then. I'll go Knicks in five. It's no, such a weird really. matchup. I don't Knicks think it's a weird matchup. You, for me, one of the things that I'm kind of worried about is like, if you look at the 76ers Knicks series, there were times because the offense was not moving the way that the Knicks wanted to, they got lazy on defense. And I think that, you know, Joel Embiid not being 100%. And after Tyrese Maxey, it gets a little wonky on the 76ers, like very hit or miss with the guys on the floor, right? So I think that in that regard, the gaps of defensive um, attack was kind of not really the killer for the Knicks. I think that if you get lazy on defense, especially when offensively you're missing Julius Randle, and that's 20 plus points per game guaranteed. If you get lazy on defense against this Pacers team, they will run away with the with the lead. And like it will you will be chasing your tail trying to get it back from them. Like you have to stay on them consistently because they have so many shooters because they have so many ways to go ahead and attack the basketball. It's not just in the paint, not just in the field, also from the three, like you can't get lazy when it comes to the defensive scheme on these guys, because they will make you pay for it. And that's the only thing that I get a little bit concerned with the Knicks. Cause sometimes they get a little lazy on their defensive effort, especially like in the third quarter, you can't do you're, that. You're asking Knicks the Knicks two to, to do, I mean, a lot of running with guys who are going to log and already have logged a ton of minutes. Like we know what that, that is true. Is, you know, I'm just, it's, I just think true. it's going to be a That's tighter a point. On the bench, you know, but Tibbs apparently doesn't believe they exist, but there are guys on the bench that can go ahead and, you know, alleviate some of that pressure, but apparently he doesn't know that they exist, but they are there. So well, <laughs> postseason is always going to tighten up your rotation anyway, but yeah, I just think it's going to be, I, I think it's going to be interesting the the stylistic differences are fascinating to me, so I can't wait to see how that shakes out. I want to throw out uh, one other thing though, because you mentioned Julius Randall. Are we sure they need Julius Randall? Oh, like, sure. are we sure? No, no. I'm just saying, like, moving forward next year, like we're we gonna see find out this good series. Brunson and OGR next to each other. If you like, they're doing it without Julius right now. Like, think about what you could get. I think back it's a good question. Julius. I'm no, just throwing it out there. I think you 100% need Julius. If you look at that 76er series, I mean, Julius would have been that body that kind of is helping you to not only defend Joel Embiid, but in the times where uh, Jalen Brunson was going cold, that's that other scorer that you can kick that out to. He's the second option. You had to rely heavily on Josh Hart, who had a phenomenal series, but that's not his game. He doesn't drain threes like that. Dante DiVincenzo, a great three-point shooter, he goes cold sometimes too. Like, Julius Randle is a guaranteed 20 points per game minimum. Like him not being on the floor, his absence was super felt. It was also felt in trying to like be a little bit more physical and aggressive. He's bigger, like he's stronger. Like you absolutely need Julius Randle. And there were various parts of that series where like his absence was 100% felt. I, I, I don't think like you could, uh, you could get a lot for Julius Randall. Just something to think no about. Way. Uh, before we wrap this up, where's my next jersey you're supposed to be sending me? I lost the bottle. I, I'm um, waiting to put it up behind me. This week, Monday. What's today? Monday? Yeah, I'm sending it out Today's after Monday. when we hang up. So it'll be hanged right there or hung rather where that 76ers jersey is. What are we doing? All playoffs? Or like no, no, it's one week. We said all okay. playoffs. Get out of here <laughs> for the rest of your days. I'm putting it up in perpetuity. <laughs> no, you get you get five days of Knicks jerseys hanging behind me for that right. and for HQ hits and all that stuff. Yeah, copy. Um, awesome. And then yeah. and then I may or may not return it to you or the trash bin outside my house. We'll that decide. Is crazy. <laughs> um, 
All right. Well, we're going to leave it there for now. We're going to be on CBS Sports Network all week. Well, not all week, but Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, almost all week, the next three days. So come and check us out tomorrow for sure on the network at 2 p.m. Eastern. And we'll preview all kinds of games. We'll discuss tonight's Nuggets and Wolves game. We'll discuss tonight's Knicks and Pacers game. But for now, for our NBA insider, Bill Ryder, for Ashley Nicole Moss, I'm John Gonzalez. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow.